We're talking about the doctrine of bias. And we'll talk about it again next week. And if your arithmetic is up to snuff, that will be four times. The importance of the doctrine of eyes is that unless we see that we consist of many eyes, we can't shift from where we are. Why would anyone want to shift from where they are? Most people are quite happy with where they are most of the time. The only time they're unhappy with where they are is when some event in life doesn't go the way they want it to go, when some person in life doesn't do what they want them to do. Otherwise, they're quite happy with where they are. They may think that they need more money. They may think that they need more love in their life, that is, more people to love them, to appreciate them, to consider them. They may think that the world needs to be a less violent place for them, but only if they're experiencing some violence. And it's violence against them, not violence that they're doing against someone else. Violence that we're doing against someone else is always justified. Violence that others are doing to us is always not justified. It can't be justified. So really, this way isn't for people who are satisfied with how things are in life and how they are in life. This way is for people who have come to a place in themselves where they are no longer satisfied with how they behave in life, with how they handle situations in life. They have begun to see that there is a repetitiveness. We all have heard history repeats itself if you don't learn from it. And history does repeat itself. And the reason it does is because we have never learned from it. When I say we, I mean the human race. If we had learned from it, there wouldn't be any more wars. If we had learned from it, there wouldn't be any more starvation. If we had learned from it, there wouldn't be any more greed. If we had learned from it, there wouldn't be any more hatred. But we haven't learned from it. There are people who will argue with that. There are people who will argue with anything. I really don't have any time for that. Because this way is not for people who, who wish to argue with it. This way is for people who wish to embrace it and who have given up the idea that they have to argue and object to everything. So that immediately leaves out a lot of people because a lot of people in this world are still ready to fight. They're still ready to crack heads to have their way. And this way isn't for skull crackers. This way is for people who are reformed skull crackers, who have realized that cracking skulls doesn't change anything. It doesn't fix anything, and it doesn't put them in a better place or shift them into a better place. So the importance of the doctrine of eyes is that we must begin to see that we consist of many eyes. Because if we don't, we can't get off the spot that we're on. We're born with essence. Essence comes down to this level, where we are now, to grow. Just in case you're wondering what you're doing here, I often wonder, what am I doing here? This is a mistake. I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to be here. Anybody ever had that feeling? Anybody not ever have that feeling? Okay, so everybody's had that feeling. We somehow get it into our heads that we're special, that we're different, special, better than everybody else, superior to everyone else. And this is all a big mistake. We don't belong here on this planet. We don't want the same things these people want. Of course, it's all a lie. It's all imagination, but we're stuck in it. So essence comes down here so that it can grow. The problem with that is it can't grow by itself. If you think back to when your children were very small, you'll notice that they didn't have negative emotions. Now, immediately, someone's mind is going to object to that. And so, yeah, well, that's just fine until you tried to take something away from them that they wanted, or if you didn't give them something that they wanted. But we really need to define negative emotions by their persistence, not by the fact that someone can get negative, but by the very fact that it's so persistent that every single time this happens, we'll get negative over it, or nine times out of 10, or whatever. But mostly, something will happen, and our reaction to it is negative. That is really how we're going to define negative emotions in order to understand what I'm talking about. Small children learn from sleeping adults, and so they learn how to be negative. Now, this may not make much sense right now, but later it will. Later, as I go on with this, I'll develop this idea and put it together. So right now, just let it sit in your lap like a brick. You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to understand it right now. You don't have to accept it or reject it right now. It doesn't have to fit into the wall right now. Right now, it's just a brick in your lap. Just let it be there. This is a mental exercise that people really need to practice. They need to practice allowing something to be without objecting to it, without making decisions about it, without having formatory reactions to it, without saying yes or no to it, but just to allow it to be. 
In meditation, you're learning to allow things to be, which is a very difficult exercise because we're used to doing something about it. An ant crawls on you, and our immediate reaction is to swipe it away. It doesn't belong there. If it crawls on us again, then we're going to maim it or kill it because we're superior to it, because might makes right, and we're more intelligent, supposedly, than ants. So therefore, we have the right to kill them. We have the right to kill any living being that is not as good as us. That's just fine in the insect world. Then it's fine in the animal kingdom. We kill animals because they got in our way. We kill animals because they compete with us for food. We kill animals because we want to eat them. We kill animals because we don't like what they do or how they sound. And so that's okay. We're willing to eradicate beings from the planet because we're superior to them, because we are better. We are more intelligent. We are God's greatest creation. And supposedly he gave us dominion and authority over all of them. And so we can kill them basically indiscriminately without much thought about it, mechanically. It's an interesting concept, actually. But then that comes right up to people. During the Second World War, Hitler said, gypsies, Catholics, homosexuals, Jews, old people are not Aryans. They are not a pure race. Therefore, they're not as good as us. And because they're not as good as us, because we are superior to them, we have the right to eradicate them. In fact, it is our duty to eradicate them. And it's our duty to eradicate them as efficiently and quickly as possible. Since they were subhuman, since they were subspecies, they weren't really as good as the Aryans, it was okay to go about an extermination process. And when you think about the extermination process, when you look at it scientifically, we can do experiments on them and we can learn how to have our race be better by sacrificing them. We can use them. We can render their bodies and render the fat and make soap. We can skin them and make lampshades or tabletops or chair backs or whatever we choose to make. We can make things from their bones. We can take the gold out of their teeth. They're not going to need them now. We can take all of their possessions because they're not going to need them where they're going. And we have to eliminate them as quickly as possible so they can dig the ditches that we'll put their bodies in after we shoot them. And see, this is where this whole idea of superiority goes. First, we start off, we're superior to ants. And that's okay. We all buy that. Then we're superior to other insects. Then we're superior to lower animals. And we buy that. That's fine. Then we're superior to other people, other races. And we buy that. That's fine. And so what we end up with is a lot of madness in the world. You've got to see it's madness. And you've got to see that that kind of thinking in order to justify taking what belongs to another in order to justify satisfying your greed for power, your greed for gold, your greed for stuff, whatever, having your way. That that's all self-justification for that. Adults basically teach children this. Once upon a time, there was a naturalist. Anybody know what a naturalist is? Well, you rednecks don't know what a naturalist is. Okay. A naturalist is a person who studies nature. John Muir was a naturalist. Anybody ever hear of John Muir? Henry David Thoreau was a sort of a naturalist. A naturalist is a person who tries to harmonize with the natural flow of life on this planet, rather than impacting it in a dominant way, in an arbitrary, arrogant, dominant way. He tries to harmonize with it. He tries to work with it. He tries to find his place in the woof and the warp the fabric of organic life on this planet. And he tries to not tear it, not shred it, not destroy it, not burn big holes in it. The American Indians were sort of naturalists. Ancient man was basically naturalist. They fit in with their world. American Indians were very strange in that when Europeans came, they didn't understand how European could go and just chop down trees, just go and chop down all the trees in an area. They never understood that. Because when they would go gather firewood, they would go and gather the fallen branches. They wouldn't cut down living things because they were living things and they felt like they belonged there. They had a place in it all. Now we find the Agent Orange that we sprayed all over Vietnam when we were trying to get the enemy so that he couldn't hide there, so that we were trying to get at the enemy. We were removing all of the foliage so that he couldn't hide there. We found now that the Agent Orange and defoliating so much of the area had changed our weather patterns on the whole planet. We realize now that the burning of the rainforest, the destruction of the rainforest in South America is affecting our weather patterns, that it's affecting the whole planet, that this whole planet is an organic whole and that it works together. And it's just like coming along and chopping your arm off or chopping your foot off or plucking out one of your eyes. It affects the whole body. 
The whole body screams in pain. The whole body pulls away. The whole body has a reaction. The whole body goes into shock. Well, even though if I only come over and just pluck out one eye, I mean, it's really a very small thing, but your whole body will go into shock. And if that shock isn't treated, you'll die. You shouldn't die from having an eye plucked out, but you can if the shock isn't treated properly. What I'm saying is the earth is like that, and a naturalist sees that. A naturalist was out one day in the country and came upon this farm. He looked out in the chicken yard, and there was a bald eagle in with the chickens. And he was just amazed because this bald eagle was pecking around, scratching in the dirt and pecking around and acting just like a chicken. And he thought, this is crazy. What is this about? So he went to the farmer and he said, I've noticed you got a bald eagle out there with the chickens. And the farmer says, yeah, isn't that the darndest thing? When that little eagle was no more than a, just a hatchling, it had fallen in the chicken yard, somehow fallen out of its nest, and it grew up there with the chickens. I didn't know what to do with it. It ate the chicken feed, and next thing I know, this bald eagle's out there, and it's starting to grow. And even though it's a lot bigger than the chickens, it doesn't seem to know that it's not a chicken. Because it grew up with all these chickens, it's been imitating all these chickens all of its life. So it scratches and eats what the chickens eat, and it does what the chickens do, and it behaves just like a chicken. It doesn't know that it's an eagle. The farmer said, it's really been strange watching this. The naturalist said, well, would you mind if I took him and set him free? He said, no, go right ahead. If you think it'll do any good. So the naturalist, he got in there and he picked up the eagle and he set him up at a fence post. He said to the eagle, look, you're not a chicken. You're an eagle. You were created to soar the heavens. You're a king among birds. You have so much more potential than anything that you see here. Spread your wings and fly. The eagle hopped off the post jumped back down in a chicken yard, started scratching around like a chicken and pecking like a chicken. The naturalist scratched his head and said, this is horrible. I got to get this eagle away from these chickens. So he took the eagle out into the forest and he said to the eagle, look, you're not a chicken, you're an eagle. You're made to soar the highest heights of the heavens. You're a king among all of the birds of the air. You can do things that a chicken could never do. You have powers that chickens will never have. You're an eagle. Now fly. The eagle just perched there. The naturalist was very upset because this just wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And a naturalist is someone who likes to have things the way they're supposed to be in nature. There's supposed to be a good end to this story, but there isn't. I'm going to stop telling the story now because it has served my purpose. My purpose is to tell you that we are eagles compared to what we manifest now. But because we grew up with a bunch of chickens, we just go scratching around and eating chicken scratch and acting like chickens and pecking each other like chickens. Anybody who's ever raised chickens knows chickens are not nice. They're not nice to their young. They're not nice to each other. They're just not nice. It's a brutal life. If you look at this planet, you'll see that we've got a lot in common with chickens. We've also got a lot in common with rats, but it's not a pretty picture. Small children don't say I. You ever notice that? They start to talk. They don't say I. They learn that from us. We say I, and we have to teach them how to say I. Think about it. When they begin to imitate us, they start right then to say I to every imagination. Whereas at first, when they're in their essence, they're just taking it all in. You look at them when they're babies. They're just taking it all in. They find a hand, and they suck it. They find a thumb, and they suck it. They find a foot, and they suck it. They do strange things. We think they're strange things. But to them, this is all exploration. This is what they came here for, to grow their essence, to discover. But then somewhere along the line, we start teaching them how to be chickens. We start teaching them how to scratch in the dirt to get the bugs and the grain. We start teaching them how to peck at another chicken to get it away from our scratch. We start teaching them all the things that make them like us. In other words, we put them to sleep. Adults acquire a wrong feeling of I, imaginary I. We imagine that we are something that we are not, like the eagle imagined that it was something that it was not. It was an eagle, but it didn't know that because it grew up with chickens, so it imagined it was just like all the other chickens. And so it acted just like all the other chickens, and it put its feeling of I into chickendom, into chickenhood, into chickenness. If essence is going to grow, everything connected with imaginary I must become passive. If that eagle was ever going to fly, was ever going to soar the heavens, was ever going to look down with the eyes of an eagle and be able to pick out a speck moving on the earth and know that it was a rabbit or a field mouse. Something was going to radically have to change with that eagle, wasn't it? It was going to have to give up this whole imaginary eye of being a chicken. The naturalist didn't have a good time with that because it's not that easily done. 
People who take animals out of the wild and raise them and then try to put them back in the wild have found that it rarely ever works because it's such a tedious, long process to get them to overcome all of the things that they learned from sleeping people. This work says that we must divide ourselves into two, the observing side and the observed side. The doctrine of eyes is important because until we can divide ourselves into two, the observing side and the observed side, we cannot have any movement, we cannot have any shift in our being. We cannot move off the dime, as it were. If man can't observe himself, he can't change. This isn't something that you can accept as an idea and live with. This is something that you will have to verify for yourself. And this is what separates the men from the boys in esoteric systems of truth. This is where you stop thinking about it and start doing something about it. You must, at this point, learn to separate yourself into two the observed and the observer. And you must begin to see that you have no hope of getting out of chickenness until you can see that there is something else. The ego is going to have to see that there is something else besides chickens. Then he's going to have to see the difference between chickens and eagles. Now, he doesn't have to see all the difference. All he has to do is see perhaps just a difference in stature, just a difference in, in weight. Maybe that's all he has to see. Maybe he'll see a difference in coloring. I don't know what he'll see. But he's got to start to observe and see something. If we always take ourselves as one, we can't change. If the eagle always takes himself as a chicken, he'll never be able to change. Surely you can see that. But if he can take himself as part eagle, part chicken, he's got a chance. He's got a chance on which he's going to put his sense of eye in. Is he going to keep his sense of eye in the chickens? Is he going to hang out with all of his chicken buddies and do all the chicken stuff that they always do, play their little chicken games? Or is he going to take a risk and start to put his sense of eye in something that he doesn't know, where he doesn't have any friends, where he doesn't have any games, where he doesn't have a mother and a father, where everything is foreign? Well, you can see already that it's going to be a tough one. The naturalist has got his work cut out for him because the familiar is so much more beautiful than the unfamiliar. We embrace the familiar. The old wine is always better. No one wants the new. They always taste the new and they say, oh, the old is better, because it's the familiar. It's that with which we have become accustomed. Lying destroys essence. Essence is the only part of us that can grow and bring us to another level of being. Your personality is never going to bring you to another level of being, ever. It's going to keep you right here. It's going to keep you right here, tied to this wheel in life that constantly repeats. Wars, sickness, birth, death, this wheel will go around and around and around and around and around. And you will repeat everything that you have suffered in this life again and again and again until you learn to separate from whatever it is that you need to separate from, until you learn from history, until you learn from your mistakes. And as a rule, we don't learn from our mistakes. So lying destroys essence, and since essence is the only part that can get us to another level of being, another fate, another position in the scale of being, lying is not a good thing. Bottom line is a liar can't grow. We're all liars. And if you protest, put that with the other brick on your lap. Just leave it there for a minute, or for a little while, and let me prepare the wall. Let me prepare the structure, and then you see for yourself whether or not those bricks will fit into the structure. If they do, great, put them in place. If they don't, well, then you've lost nothing except whatever time it takes you to listen to this. It's like we've all got armies of lying eyes that are connected with the activity of self-justifying eyes. The work says there are two forms of lying, lying to oneself and lying to others. Lying to others is something that we do pretty much all the time. Lying to ourself is something that the work says is much more dangerous, much more dangerous because it has the power to destroy essence. Lying to others is more of a social lubricant. Think about it. We lie to others so that socially things are smoother. Well, what do you think of my new hat? That is the ugliest hat I have ever seen in my life. Somebody ought to cut your head off just to get rid of the hat. That's not acceptable socially. So we lie. We say, oh, that's, that's nice. I like the feathers. It's really nice. Lying can only be defined by a relationship to some system of truth. If you've never been taught right and wrong about truth and falsity, how can you lie? Until someone puts a standard down, until someone drives a stake in the ground, someone makes a point on a map, it's all just there. It's all just undefined. But when someone makes one point on a map, one point in a field, and drives a stake there, you've got one point as a reference. An esoteric system of truth is that standard, is that reference point, so that things can then be referenced to that point. Remember the film 2001 A Space Odyssey? 
They were like monkeys. They were people, supposedly, but they were like monkeys, gorillas or whatever, apes, whatever. The stone appeared one day, this big black obelisk stone thing, whatever it was. I can't remember exactly. Does anybody remember what it was? A monolith. monolith. That's what it was. It wasn't an obelisk. It was a monolith. And they were all, oh, oh, oh. and then the next thing they, you know, they were picking up bones and cracking each other's skulls, remember? That represents the standard, see, that comes from out of our experience, from out of the chicken yard. The naturalist comes along and he says, look, this is not a chicken. The farmer says, I know it, but it doesn't know it. The farmer says, this is wrong. The naturalist is the man who represents that monolith that comes down from above, that comes from outside of the chicken yard, and it sets the standard. You're not a chicken. Well, yes, I am. No, you're not. And then the battle begins, and it's a battle. It's a war within ourselves. Once the standard has been set, once it's been driven into you, once that spike has been driven into you, you're stuck. See, you're stuck. I've ruined your life, and you know it. Sometimes you're glad about it, and sometimes you're not so glad about it. But the bottom line is, I've ruined your life. I've said, you're not a chicken. You're an eagle. And you've been able to see an eagle feather here and there. You've been able to see that there are certain aspects of your being that are changing. You've been able to see that it may be true. You may not have to stay in the chicken yard. And that's a terrible thing and a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing because we got a chance. It's a terrible thing because we've got to work. And so we curse me for the work and we love me for the chance. The work says you must not lie to your teacher. The lie in the work is lying in reference to a definite system of truth. This work is a definite system of truth. To lie in this work is to lie in a definite system of truth, to oppose a definite system of truth. It's a lot like cutting your throat to pour food into your stomach. What your mouth is for is to put the food in and chew it and then swallow it. But if you find a better way, a shortcut, and you cut your throat and just slide that back there and then start throwing the food down, you're going to die. And that's what lying in a definite system of truth is like. It's like cutting your throat to feed yourself. I know, it's a very graphic example, but that's the way I see things. I have very graphic mental images, and I feel very strongly about this. Our psychic life can only develop through truth, taught to you, followed, and lived. The only way that eagle had a chance was for that naturalist to come and teach him that he was not a chicken. It had to come from outside. That eagle was never going to discover by himself that he was not a chicken. And the chickens weren't going to tell him. <laughs> They'd look and go, man, that eagle could eat us all up for lunch. It's a good thing that dummy doesn't know he's an eagle. He thinks he's a chicken. Well, let's not anybody tell him. So it's a matter of survival for the chickens to keep this eagle a chicken. See the similarities between us? We sure enough want to keep people down. We don't want them getting too far above us because we're chicken-like in our mentality. The living of truth means work on yourself. It means you want to follow what the work teaches. You have had to come to the point. And if you haven't, what are you doing here? Have you come to the point where you want to follow what this work teaches? Where the idea of having it taken away from you is not a pleasant concept. It's like, oh, wait a second. No, I'm willing to give things up to keep this. This has become so valuable to me. I'm willing to sacrifice other things to have this. That kind of shift starts. Remember when you were first introduced to this and you scratched your head and thought, He's definitely gone off his rocker this time. Food for the moon. Come on. What is he talking about? You remember how it was in the beginning? It was strange. It was very strange. These ideas were so strange. They didn't make sense. It was all this different. No, stop it. You're making my head hurt. Give me that old time religion. It was good enough for Moses. It's good enough for me. It was good enough for Bozo the Clown. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for all the rest of those people. It's good enough for me. I don't want to have to think. I don't want to have to work. I don't want to have to look at myself. I don't want to see that I'm not what I think I am. It's very unpleasant at first. Lying internally blocks the influence of the work in yourself. So you want to follow this work, but lying internally blocks the influence that the work could have on you in yourself. It blocks it. It cuts you off from the very thing that could save your life. As long as that eagle's lying to itself, and saying it's a chicken, and it wants to be a chicken. It cuts itself off from any influence the naturalist could have on it. No matter what the naturalist says, the eagle inside is saying no, 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 no. Internal lying is like that. All development depends on your relating yourself to a system of teaching which doesn't lie in life. Think about it. Think about the thing you fear and value. Someone who won't lie. You fear and value a person who won't lie, depending on what your aim is. That's what you do. You fear or you value. You're doing something in life you know is counterproductive. Who is the one person you are absolutely going to give a wide berth to? You know you're not coming around. You know it because you've done it. 
Well, I'm just kind of like, I just don't feel like it. I just really can't handle him right now. Well, you know, he's so prick. You know, he's just going to hurt me. The activity of the self-justifying eyes. You see, these army of lying eyes that are all, was it I said, it was good, whatever it was. But now I can't remember what it was. There's something about an army of lying eyes. We've got armies of lying eyes connected with the activity of self-justifying eyes. And this activity of self-justifying eyes is tremendous. It's always going on. I mean, we are always justifying ourselves. And so these lying eyes are working with that. That's what I wanted to say. All development depends on relating yourself to a system of teaching which doesn't lie in life. Work is basically a second education. Life educates us. Harvard, Oxford, USC, UCLA, Smith, all these places educate us. But they educate us in life. We need something that comes from outside of the chicken yard. And the naturalist comes from outside of the chicken yard. And he educates us or gives us the opportunity for a second education. That eagle got its first education in the chicken yard. That's where it got the idea. That's how it survived. That eagle would not have survived if it hadn't been for the chickens. This is the irony of the whole thing. So Essence comes here, plunks right down in a chicken yard so that it can grow, and the very thing that gives it the opportunity to grow also hinders its growth. Unless something comes from outside and wakes it up to the fact that it has a possibility of being something besides what it takes itself to be. You have a possibility of being something other than what you have taken yourself to be and what this whole world has told you you are. And this depends on your second education. This work is a second education, and it's designed to bring you face to face with an entirely different way of living in life. Can you see the difference between living as a chicken and living as an eagle in the same life? Huge difference. Huge difference. The same thing for us. This work is designed to bring us face to face with the fact that we could live in this life entirely differently. How religion missed the point on this, I don't know, but somehow they missed it. They think that, oh no, it's not about this life. You just be a good person here. Just be a better person. You don't have to be like Christ. Just be a better person. I am amazed at how many people have chicken expectations of themselves. And then I don't know why I should be amazed because churches are chicken yards. And they're just teaching people how to be chickens. They're just teaching them how to do the chicken walk. And they dance like chickens and they eat like chickens and they flap like chickens and they cluck like chickens. And you go around and they're all the same. You know you're in a chicken yard church, don't you? You go to any church, any church, anywhere. You know you're in a church because they're all acting the same way. Get them out of there, and you won't know which church they belong to. Why is that? Because they all act different when they're out of the chicken yard. Why? Well, because they're acting when they're there. It's amazing how little people expect of themselves. Really, when you think about it, how little we expect of ourselves, how weak and frail we really think we are. And it takes huge disasters or catastrophes for us to reach down inside and find anything worth anything and yank it up and rise up and meet the situation. What I'm saying is we can do that without the disasters. We can do that ourselves. And that's what this second education is about. Why wait for life to give you the conscious shocks if you can learn to give them to yourself and to straighten the line so that instead of constantly getting off target, you can keep your aim and keep moving onward and upward toward what you want. Understanding the law of seven and understanding where those shocks are needed and then understanding that you can give yourself those shocks can keep you traveling in the direction you want to be going in, the aim that you've set. It can keep you adjusting, it can keep you correcting, it can keep you on the mark. Not expressing negative emotions socially is different from the work way. It's apart from external appearances. Not expressing negative emotions socially is what we do when you're trying to get a job. So what do you do? Hey, you just walk in any old way and you sit down, put your feet up, light a cigarette, and start talking to the potential boss. Yeah. That works, doesn't it? No, we don't do that, do we? Because we want something, we behave in the way that we expected to behave. We don't go in and start cussing and swearing, and we don't whip a beer out of the cooler and pop it open and say, hey, you want to hit? You know, and we don't light a joint. We don't do those things. Well, unless we're trying to get a job with a cartel boss, you know, for a drug cartel. Then you walk in and you shoot somebody, you know, and you snort a line of coke or whatever. But if you're trying to get a job in the world, you don't do that. You behave in the way that you are expected to behave. We have socially learned not to express negative emotions. You look at the boss and you go, oh, I'm not going to like this guy, and I can tell right now. He's a jerk. And so you stand up and you say, you're a jerk. Well, you're out of there. Forget it. You don't get the job. So we don't do that. We learn socially not to express negative emotions. But it's all for external appearances. It's not for anything internal. The work way is different. Not expressing negative emotions is an internal thing. It is to benefit you internally, not externally. 
Lying destroys essence because essence can only grow through truth. Man must stop deceiving himself in order to grow. We've got to stop lying to ourselves. We don't even know where to begin. So we've got to divide ourselves, separate ourselves, the observed and the observer, and then we can see, we can start to see where we lie to ourselves through sincere self-observation over a long period of time and directed by the work, directed by the monolith that comes from outside, directed by the naturalist that comes from outside the chicken yard. We can begin to see what is there. It's like clouds, people. You're lying on your back out there looking up at the clouds and someone points up and goes, oh, look at that cloud, it looks like a swan. You go, what cloud looks like? What are you talking about? And then they take and they trace it out for you and you see it and, and, and sure enough, a swan appears in the clouds. And you go, oh, wow, that's so cool. And that's all we're talking about. We're talking about learning how to see what's there. Imaginary eye is the imagination that we have real eye in us. See, we think we have real eye. We think this is real me. This is me. No, but you don't understand this is me. No, I do understand this is not you. You don't understand that this is not you. And so you have little catchphrases that you remind yourself with. That is not I. I don't have to identify with this feeling. I don't have to identify with this thought. I don't have to identify with this old association. I don't have to stay in this prison. If I can back away from this, I can free myself from this. Imaginary I is the imagination that we have real I in us already. So we put our feeling of I into this imaginary I. This is me. No, this is not you. That's the good news. What's the bad news? <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work to get out of there. That's the bad news. But what's the good news? It can be done. There are others who have done it before you. And they have left a road map. And they left tools. And they'll even help you along the way. And you don't have to know how right now. All you have to know is there's a way if you want it. See, when we have this imaginary I, the imagination that we have real I in us, it gives us all kinds of fantastic ideas about ourselves. See, it's like this. So here are these chickens, and they see this eagle, and let's say the eagle does get to fly, and the eagle's just... And they go, whoa, I'm an eagle. And all the chickens are out there, I'm an eagle. And they all start acting like eagles. They all start strutting around, pecking the other chickens. Of course, that's what chickens do. But this time, they have this imagination that they're eagles now, while they're pecking the other chickens. Now they have a right to peck the other chickens, because they're eagles, and they're just chickens. So since they're superior, they can peck them all day long if they want to. Because that is proving their eagleness and disproving their chickenness. And this is what we do. So we get these fantastic ideas about ourselves. We think we can do. We think that we have real will. We think that we can decide our own lives. This is really comical when you think about it. If you'll sit back and think about it like a chicken yard and look at the chickens and see the chickens pretending to be eagles. Just see that in your mind's eye. See a bunch of chickens out in a chicken yard just imagining that they're eagles. It really is kind of comical, isn't it? It's kind of sad too, but it's kind of comical because their imagination won't make it so. It won't make them eagles. It won't change them at all. Their behavior may appear to them to be different, but to us it appears to be just like chickens. Do you ever think what a chicken's thinking when it's being a chicken? Probably not much. We can't see that everything just happens in life, even our own lives, and we're offended by that. No, my life doesn't just happen. This is America. I'm the king of my castle. I'm the master of my ship. I'm the arbiter of my destiny. It's up to me. I'm in charge here. That's imaginary, people. That is pure imagination. You are in charge of so little that some naturalist standing outside your chicken yard looking at you can only look with compassion. You look at your children with compassion when you see some of the stupid stuff that they're going to do. They're going to do it. And you know they're going to do it. And there's nothing you can do about it except look with compassion, love them, and try to be there for them when it all comes crashing down on them. But you can't tell them any more than you could tell the chicken. Look, you're not an eagle, you little squirt. You're a chicken. We form in ourselves secret imagination to which life does not conform, and yet we cling to it thinking that we're supermen, never seeing what we're actually like. Well, I could do that if I wanted to. I could do anything if I put my mind to it. Well, why don't you do it? Well, I don't want to. It's a lie. And we lie to ourselves and then we justify it. And this is what is so tragic about us is this lying internally. Imagining that we can do things that we cannot do. Imagining that we are something we are not. Ascribing things to ourselves that we do not possess. We could possess, but we do not now possess. We have the possibility of possessing these things, but we do not now possess them. And what keeps us from ever possessing them is the imagination that we now possess them because what you think you have, you will never look for. You will only seek what you feel you do not have. But if you have ascribed all of these superpowers to yourself, you will never seek them. You'll just imagine that you have them and you'll scratch around in the chicken yard with the rest of the chickens, boasting what a tough eagle you are and how you could soar two miles high. This is our secret imagination. 
And when life doesn't conform, we imagine that it does. Imaginary eye prevents us from seeing where we actually are, what our lives have been. Just look at what your life has been. It's not a pretty picture. That's why we change memory. That's why some of our favorite memories never happened. We don't like it, we alter it. That's the power of imagination. And imagination keeps us fast asleep in continual self-lying, pretense, and self-hypnotism. This is our condition, and we can't see it. We don't really see it because we live in false personality, which is built by imaginary eye and its fantasies. And until false personality is made passive, we're not going to see it. We've got to have a break in the clouds in order to see the sun. You look out there right now and you can't see the sun. It's just overcast with fog everywhere. We need a break in the clouds to get a glimpse of the sun. We need a break in false personality. We need to find a break in it. We need to separate from it, get apart from it just long enough to catch a glimpse of the possibility. Imaginary eye and its fantasies are supporting false personality. They made false personality. They're building it constantly and constantly repairing it. That's the problem. It's a constant battle. It's constantly renewing itself and being repaired. And so it must be made passive. And this can only be done through the doctrine of eyes. We've got to see that we consist of many eyes because that's the only way we're going to be able to shift from having our sense of eye and false personality, our sense of self and false personality, and shift it to something else, something apart from that. Next week, we'll finish this up and talk about the parable of the magicians and possibly the parable of the carriage because they both are great examples of the power of imaginary eye and self-hypnosis. <laughs>